Good evening to all of you, to tonight's honoree, Laura Esselman, Michael Endicott, her husband, their son, Max, past honorees, members of the Arbuckle family, honored guests, faculty, staff, students, and friends. Welcome all to the 46th annual Arbuckle Award Dinner. In 1968, the remarkable Ernie Arbuckle stepped down as Dean of the Stanford Graduate School of Business, having led the school through a major transformation. Ernie's key contribution was to demonstrate that a business school rooted in the disciplines of the social sciences could bring a rigor to the study and teaching of management that had previously been lacking in business education. In the decades since Ernie, we have remained true to the path that he set us on, but we have steadily broadened the scope of the problems to which the mastery of management and leadership can successfully be applied, because we believe that the biggest problems in the world, problems of healthcare, education, clean water and energy, global health, and global poverty, are at their core business, leadership, and management challenges. We summarize this enhanced mission in our ambition to change lives, change organizations, and change the world. In short, we are educating change agents who can make a meaningful difference in the world. Tonight's honoree, Laura Esselman, is a great example of such a change agent. In her case, one who has made a major impact in healthcare. Not only does she conduct basic science and practice as a surgeon, but she's a fearless advocate for her point of view on the appropriate treatment of breast cancer more broadly. In this way, she touches the lives of not only the patients she treats, but so many more around the world. I know there are many in this room whose lives or those of loved ones have been profoundly impacted by cancer, and we thank Laura for her tireless efforts. I first met Laura when she was here as an MBA student in my first year strategic management class. She came up to me before the start of one of our classes to explain that she might have to leave in the middle of class. That was pretty unheard of. What, after all, could be so important that it would pull you out of my class? <laughs> she explained that she had performed surgery the night before, and she might be beeped if her patient needed care. I have to say that is the most compelling reason I've heard for skipping class <laughs> before or since. I would now like to draw your attention to the, this framed award that is beside me on the stage. It is from the Congressional Record of the U.S. House of Representatives, presented by the Honorable Jackie Speer, and begins as follows. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to honor Laura Esselman, MD, MBA, of San Francisco, California, in recognition of her receiving the Stanford Graduate School of Business Distinguished, Distinguished Ernest C. Arbuckle Award during the annual award ceremony in Stanford, California on March the 3rd, 2016. It is wonderful, I think, for Laura and the Arbuckle Award to receive this additional recognition and for all of us to come together to honor Laura as she joins an illustrious list of those who have received the Arbuckle Award for their outstanding contributions to the GSB and to society. If I could, I'd like to uh, give some perspective about the Arbuckle Award and recognize a few past recipients. Each year, the Arbuckle Award honors a Stanford Graduate School of Business alumnus, alumna, or an individual closely connected with the school for their lifelong achievement in the areas of management leadership and community service. 
It is appropriate that Ernie was the first recipient, and so may I ask the members of the Arbuckle family who are with us this evening to please stand and be recognized. Since 1968, 45 other individuals have received the Arbuckle Award. Seven of them are represented here this evening. I would like to recognize each of them. Please stand as I call your name. The 2014 award winner from the class of 1960 was Bob King. In 2012, we gave the award to someone who had the trifecta. He was a Sloan 1966, an MBA 1967, and a PhD 1970. He had not had enough of the business school, and so he came back to serve as our eighth dean, Bob Joss. In 2008, the award went to Henry Sagerstrom from the class of 48, and he's represented this evening by his widow, Elizabeth Sagerstrom. In 1996, from the class of 1957, John Morgridge. In 1985, from the class of 49, Don Peterson. In 1979, the award went to Roy Anderson from the class of 49, who is represented by his widow, Betty Anderson. Okay, there's one left. At this point, I would like to invite all of the previous Arbuckle Award winners who turn 100 this week <laughs> to please stand. RJ, it's great to have you here with us this evening. I would now like to thank all of the fellowship donors who are here tonight. There are more than 76 of you. I'd ask you to stand and to please remain standing for a moment. And while you're still standing, I would like to recognize the 85 fellowship recipients who are in attendance tonight. Would you also please stand? What an incredible gathering of the GSB community. Thank you all. As is the tradition at the GSB, each year the recipient of the Arbuckle Award is introduced by a person who has a special connection to the honoree. Tonight, I'm pleased to welcome our very own Jeffrey Pfeffer to that role. 
Jeff is the Thomas D. D., the second professor of organizational behavior and has been at the GSB since 1979. Jeff, as you know, is the author of numerous scholarly articles and management books. He has focused most recently in his teaching and writing on power in organizations and teaches a popular elective called Paths to Power. Please join me in welcoming Jeff to the podium. So thank you all. RJ has a very special place in my heart. He was the dean the year I was hired. It was probably his last mistake. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge the Arbuckle family, the previous winners, the alums, past and future, who make this community so special. It is a true honor to be able to introduce you tonight, if you don't already know her, to this year's Arbuckle Award winner, Laura Esserman, who has looked at me throughout the dinner saying, what is he going to say? <laughs> Laura was a student in my class in power in 1993. I then wound up writing a case on her in 2003, and she is mentioned in my book on power. If you do not know Laura, I would highly recommend you go to the New York to the Google to Google and search under Laura Esserman New York Times, where you will see an amazing profile on an amazing human being. And my introduction will not do her justice. It's a great it's a great article. If one is going to change lives, change organizations, and change the world, yes, pardon me. I also need to acknowledge the wonderful Esserman family that I've been sitting with. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> including, including Laura's mother, her sisters, her son Max, and her uh, photographically, um, photographically brilliant husband, Michael Endicott. It's a wonderful to, to be with all of them, and of course, her nephew, Steve. If one is going to change lives, change organizations, and change the world, one needs to be, like Laura, a force of nature. Four qualities, there are many, but four qualities I think define Laura and, um, and my knowledge of her. First of all, there's energy. When Laura was a student in my class, she of course never came to class on time. <laughs> and she's still running late, but that's okay. As it turns out, while she was a full-time student in the GSB, she was also practicing medicine full-time and delivering her first child, which is quite something. Now, Laura still exemplifies energy. She and I were going to give a talk at some quality conference, and I had just come back from Alaska. The phone rings. It's Laura. And Laura, we, we talked about the fact that we had to fill in for a speaker who was going to be missing. And I said, Laura, what time does the conference start? And she said, 8. And I, she could tell I was not happy about that. And I will never forget what she said. She said, Jeffrey, you know, if you're going to change the world, you don't begin by taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> the, sec the second quality that defines Laura is patience, persistence, and resilience. I can recall again being in a conference giving a talk on, uh, the, the, and this was the launch of the Athena Project. And at that conference was Richard Blum. Richard Blum, the husband of uh, Diane Feinstein, chairman at the time of the California Board of Regents, and of course, a very wealthy person in his own right. And having been introduced to Dick Blum, I said, how did Laura get you here? And I will never forget his answer. He looked at me and he said, probably the same way she got you here. That when you tell Laura no, she doesn't really understand the word. So, so he looked at me and he said, I've learned over the years that you're gonna do what she wants you to do anyway, so you can save yourself the aggravation. So the proper answer to her request, and I will never forget this, from Diane, as in Feinstein or Laura, is yes, dear, because you're going to do it anyway. <laughs> Thirdly, Laura is an individual who has never accepted excuses for why things couldn't happen, even if they looked impossible. Excuses as to why she could not bring the various specialties together in one center at the University of California, San Francisco. Excuses about why you could not get 
the Food and Drug Administration to change the drug development process. This is an individual who never accepts excuses. Fourth, and perhaps most importantly, she has an amazing ability and willingness to learn, grow, and to change herself in ways over the years that have made her ever more effective and influential. Success often breeds complacency, and even though she had a successful clinical practice, Laura Esserman wanted to do more and understood the skills that would be required to get things done with less effort. Her openness to personal transformation makes her actually an outstanding exemplar of the GSB and its successful endeavor to educate, not to just to educate people in technical knowledge, but to help them truly change and grow in their leadership capabilities. Laura Esserman has indeed changed lives, changed organizations, and changed the world. I'm gonna do this in reverse order. In terms of changing the world, she has, or is very much in the process of, making profound changes in the world of medicine. Her leadership in promoting adaptive drug design promises to fix the fundamentally broken drug development process. She has relentlessly, a word that I choose intentionally, encouraged innovation and change throughout medicine, changing how other physicians practice, including the use of mammography for screening, including the use and when you do radiation, including all kinds of things, including the change of recruitment of patients for clinical trials. She has certainly changed and founded organizations, breastcancertrials.org, Athena, Wisdom, with 100,000 women now involved in a um, data gathering project, iSpy, the adaptive drug design organization, Quantum Leap, patient-centered care in an academic medical center, the Carol Frank Buck Breast Care Center, and a whole lot more. And I have seen firsthand how Laura Esterman has changed and touched lives, even for people who aren't her patients. Most recently, I have a friend, I won't use his last name because I understand HIPAA, Noah. <laughs> Noah is married to a woman named Janessa. Janessa is in her 30s. And it became pretty clear to me, because they're both um, social scientists, that Janessa was not on a course with stage four cancer that was gonna do her very much good. So I said to Noah, I'll get Laura Esserman to get in touch with you. This is somebody, they live in LA, no particular connection, but Laura, of course, who is one of the most compassionate human beings in the world, reached out and called them, got them enrolled in a UCLA clinical trial, and when then she failed in that clinical trial, now has Janessa enrolled in a clinical trial at the University of California, San Francisco. I would ask you, if you go to congratulate Laura tonight, that you look carefully at the necklace that she is wearing. It is a necklace given to her by one of her former patients, Linnea. Linnea met Laura when she was 29 and then finally died at 36. As Linnea was in her last stages of life, Laura, of course, um, as she will often do with her patients, reached out and said, you know, what, what do you want to accomplish? Or, you know, and Linnea said, you know, I, I'm sad because I will never get to have a child with the love of my life. I won't finish my thesis. She was getting a PhD in sociology at Berkeley, and I will never be able to go to Greece. And Laura, as Laura's always want to do, says, well, let's work on what we can actually get accomplished. Love of your life may be a little tough at this point, but you know, can't we get some of your friends to finish um, your, help you finish your thesis? And Linnea wasn't willing to do that. So Laura said, of course, let's, can't you, can't you go to Greece? And so her friends got together and bought her a ticket to, to go to Greece. But the night before Linnea was going to Greece, Laura called Linnea because Laura has a very different connection with her patients, as any of you who have ever been treated by her understand. So she called Linnea and said, you know, how are you doing? Linnea said, I'm not going. I don't have anything to wear. I, you know, I'm tired. I don't feel well. And Laura put her two children, young at that time, in the car, drove to Oakland, brought stuff for Linnea to wear, packed her up, and she went to Greece. And the, and the necklace that Laura has on tonight was Linnea's gift from her purchased at Mykonos. More than just providing technically, more than just providing technically excellent science-based care, 
Laura Esserman, who gives out her cell phone number generously, offers compassion and support to people in some of the most difficult moments of their lives. She sings songs of hope and love and holds the hands of her patients and friends, both metaphorically and literally. Having known Laura and her family for more than two decades, I have witnessed at close range the work of a truly exceptional individual. It is a privilege and honor to be able to introduce you to Dr. Laura Esserman, MD, MBA, and one of the most forceful, indeed powerful, but also compassionate humanists I have ever had the privilege of knowing. That was an incredibly beautiful tribute, Jeff. I, 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 am, I have to say I was amazed, and I am so honored to receive this award. I was very surprised. And really, it is such an honor to be in such august company. As I was looking at the list of the Arbuckle winners, I thought to myself, this is actually a list of change makers, people that challenge the reigning paradigm in their field. And I began to reflect a little bit about the ingredients for change. Imagination, inspiration, courage, and perhaps most important, a true sense of urgency. I came to Stanford back in 1978 to come to Stanford Medical School. I came to the West Coast because to me it represented unfettered imagination and therefore opportunity. I came to Stanford because the medical school was part of a university and there were no required courses and no, no grades. <laughs> I think ours was the last class where that happened. Um, However, I, I was excited to be part of a university that pioneered uh, the integration of the disciplines. And so I had the luxury to take classes everywhere, and I, I, I think I did take classes in almost every graduate school on the campus. And when I was an engineering TA, I, was, uh, I, I actually um, audited, audited a class from Alan Entoven, which is my first introduction to the business school. But I also had the incredible opportunity to identify those people who I thought were the best in their field, the most innovative, to clinician scientists who I thought were going to really change the field. People like Ron Levy, who I was incredibly lucky to work with for three years. He's still a mentor to me, still giving me ideas for the ice spy trial. Um, but still, I could not imagine that I would have gone to business school. But one man had that imagination, and that was Alan and Tobin. Uh, and now I understand that it was R.J. Miller who, who, uh, who hired Alan. So in fact, I owe it to R.J. Um, I actually uh, invited Alan to give grand rounds. I was the chief resident in general surgery, and I invited Alan to give grand rounds uh, on his new book, Health Plan, which is a fantastic idea then, and it still is. And uh, Alan, we're, we're still going to get to that. <laughs> still a good idea. Only now it's possible, I think. Um, and after his talk, I, in the Q&A, I said, Alan, who is going to, or Professor Endoven at the time, I said, who is going to train the next generation of physicians in your new model? And he said, well, I'll answer that later. So after the talk, I said, so what's the answer? And he said, well, Laura, if you want to make change, come meet me at my office. Uh, and, and I'll tell you. And I said, well, I, I was a Saturday. I had to round. I, you know. He said, I'll wait for you. I said, really? So I went to his office, and he handed me a packet. And he said, the answer to your question, Laura, is you. I want you to come to the business school and be a Hartford Fellow and learn the tools of modern management and change medicine. And I looked at him, and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> I was pregnant at the time. Um, and I really couldn't quite get my head around it. My uh, 
then boss, the chair of surgery, told me that I would never get a job in surgery again if I went to the business school. That perhaps inspired me to go. Um, but I... <laughs> Everyone thought it was a ridiculous idea, except for Ron Levy and Peter Bing and my former chair, John Collins. And I began to think about this, and I could see then that the delivery of care was probably the most important, uh, the, was going to have the most enormous impact on our ability to get innovative uh, medicines to patients and to change clinical medicine, which is a little bit conservative and does not change very fast. I was incredibly lucky to go. I think I, when I started, I could not have imagined that the GSB actually was perhaps my best educational, greatest educational experience. And I was trying to think about why that is so. I really learned to integrate uh, the learnings across industries. I learned about collaboration and adaptation. And in thinking about why it was such an incredible experience for me, part of it was that I was more mature and I was going to learn. I was going for a very specific purpose that Ellen had charged me with. And that experience actually inspired me to start our Breast Care Center internship program. It's a post-baccalaureate program that we run for undergraduates to spend a couple of years before they go to medical school. While, we, while they're young and impressionable and we can still train them to really think about how to integrate care and research. And to they, through my colleague Jeff Belcora and through the program that Meredith Buxton and I have started, they actually are able to spend a day a week helping patients do consultation recording. They actually learn to walk the shoes of the patient. So they learn to become advocates for their patients instead of advocates for their specialties. This is the future. Of our, of our profession, and we have our first ever reunion that Alan's going to come and, and Jeff are going to come and speak at. I, I think then the other thing that I learned was I learned about systems. I learned about other industries. I learned that medicine was just another industry. And like every other industry, it wasn't like other industries, but in fact, it had many things in common. And there was no reason why we couldn't learn how to innovate the way the most progressive industries had innovated. I learned that you have to think about organizational behavior. And I learned that, um, uh, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I have to say, I even learned accounting, uh, which of course turns out to be very important. The numbers, of course, really matters. I wouldn't say it was all easy. When I first was, I, there was actually a lot of culture change. You know, medicine, we do everything alone. We tend to do things on, you know, we're trained, we, we get in because we get good grades, we air PIs, we're first authors on papers. It's not really a team sport. And so when I looked at the schedule, I thought, and Alan, of course, had promised me it would be a work study program. I never read the fine print. As my husband knows, I never read the direction. So I, uh, uh, it wasn't all that easy because I had that study group. Why would I study in a group? So I just picked, I did call then and discovered that I actually had to do things in groups. I uh, had, a few, uh, had a few roadblocks, like firing my nanny at the last minute. And so Marisa, my daughter, who unfortunately couldn't be here because she was in graduate school, Northwestern, and, uh, uh, was a constant, my constant companion at school. And uh, my, class, my classmates from 93 know her well, or knew her when she was so. And I had to import my father to teach me accounting 210B over Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> I hope when my kids are 36, they can still come to me for their homework. Um, it took me quite some time to figure out how to integrate uh, the learnings. Uh, and I, I, I did have this uh, moment in Garth Saloner's class. I, I had just taken my oral boards in surgery, and I was taking a cab back from the airport, and I, which I shared with one of my vascular surgeons. He said, well, where are you going? I said, uh, I'm going to the business school. And uh, you're doing what? And I said, no, 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 I'm really learning about modern management. And I walked into Garth's class, and we were uh, doing a case on crown, cork, and seal. And I thought to myself, oh my god, what have I done with my life? <laughs> and Garth, I still forgive you for picking on me for all the pharmaceutical industry uh, case studies, but perhaps I owe you my devotion to changing that industry through the iSpy trial. Um, I finally figured out that what I should do is pick one disease, and I picked breast cancer. And I would integrate from science, 
from, from care to science to policy and try and figure out how to bring all the different disciplines together, try and create change across the spectrum from prevention all the way to metastatic care, and really think about focusing on the need for feedback, for rapid learning, you know, the model of Andy Grove and the semiconductor industry, and that's how I started. And I thought a lot about the model of trying to learn faster and realized that these industries that were moving fast really recognized the risk was in standing still and accepting the status quo. And I have to say that as far as I know, when I am in clinic, patients do not love the options we offer them. 40,000 women a year are still dying of breast cancer. And for that, we are clearly not moving fast enough. And so to make change, you have to recognize what works and what doesn't work. And one of the tricks to try and drive that culture of innovation and change is to help people recognize when things are working and when they're not. And by changing the order of care and coming up with surrogate endpoints to learn, instead of just giving treatments and hope for the best, when you see that they are not working, it's a very powerful motivator. And it allows people to say, wow, what we're doing is not so good, and people can be much more accepting of change. I was very fortunate to take organizational behavior from Jeff Pfeffer. And I was inspired to really think about what it takes to get things done. And that in order to get things done, you have to build a culture of innovation. I did that at the Breast Care Center at UCSF. I did it with my colleagues, Mel and I, creating the iSpy trial, and including my colleague, Laura Vanfeer. The Athena breast care, the Athena model that we created across the University of California, integrating the five University of California campuses, and, uh, and the Quantum Leap uh, 501c3 uh, <clears throat> group that actually is the glue that has enabled us to keep all these pieces together, for which many of the board members are in, this, are in the room. It is important to have a systems approach. That is, I think, perhaps the most important thing that I learned. I learned that uh, if you don't do that, you're not going to learn. And I thought a lot about why do we have a system of care that is separate from a, se from a system of research? What is the purpose of clinical practice? What are we practicing for? We should be practicing to get better. And the only way you get better is to learn about what you're doing and get constant feedback on what you do. But our systems in medicine don't work that way. And when I saw the Bloomberg systems and I thought about how the finance sector changed, I thought, OK, uh, that's something that we can do in medicine. And uh, I, I have to comment that when I was at my 20th year reunion and my classmates asked me what I was doing, I said, oh, I'm working on systems, really, to get feedback and change care. They said, weren't you doing that when you graduated from business school? Didn't you say you were going to get that done in the next year? And I said, well, yeah, I'm still working on that, but only now I'm really a year away. And I will tell you now, I'm really only a year away. Only this time, I mean it. Um, so personalized medicine, this term is now all the rage. So what does it really mean? It means to me tailoring care to biology, uh, patient preference, and clinical performance. But to make that a reality, we need to know what we're doing. We need to know constantly what our outcomes are. We know, need to know what our costs are. We need to make sure that our incentives are aligned to make things better, and there has to be transparency. Now, many have, people have said, can we afford the money it takes for all these innovative therapies? Well, if we stopped wasting our money on things that really don't work, there would be plenty of money for innovation, right? And there is plenty that we do in medicine that doesn't work, but we keep doing it, and we need to stop. Personalized medicine means doing more for some, and less for others. One of the reasons why I am a champion of the concept of overdiagnosis is not because I don't think that breast cancer is a serious disease. In fact, it's because I think it's such a serious disease. But overtreating people who don't have real disease or that's not going to kill them causes only harm, does not help anyone, and it also it prevents us from learning from the people who, in, who, who really do have that serious disease. So I think it's important for us to really think about repurposing the money in our systems, which we're doing in the wisdom trial, 
and get the insurers on board to say, look, if we're going to make change and change in screening, everyone has to have skin in the game, and you have to help pay for that change, because you are going to be the one downstream to reap those benefits. Our allies in this work are the self-insured employers, because our incentives are aligned. At the end of the day, the heart of all I do is about accelerating learning in medicine. And I, the iSpy trial model is all about adaptive design, getting the right drug to the right patient at the right time. The Athena model is about integrating care and research and trying to drive, get patient data to drive learning and to make sure that we get innovation to people faster. The wisdom study is about a coverage with evidence model to really test personalized screening versus, versus annual screening and really repurpose some of the billions of dollars in the screening business. Clinical trial matching to make sure that clinical trial participation, which is the way we learn about every new innovation, becomes the routine and not the exception. And finally, our last big initiative is this one source concept where we're trying to think about ways to change medicine so that we actually have data that's entered once and used many times. This is an introduction of mission critical checklists to be used at the point of care that are standards based and it's a shared model. Not every individual person writing their own thing that never will be shared, never will be used. We see people every day and throw this data away. But if we could do this at the point of care, and this is a huge undertaking that we're working on with Salesforce, um, I would say, finally, we could leverage the power of computing to make care better, to automate quality improvement, to make trial matching possible, to make trial enrollment routine, to give patients better services that really improve their quality of life, to enable registries and more. This is what would bring true transformation. At the heart of accelerated learning is a data-driven model of medicine. This is what will allow innovation in healthcare value. If you want to solve the problem of healthcare costs, give the clinicians a chance to get the information at their fingertips, harness their imaginations, and get them to solve the problems of how to get better products to patients at a, at a, at a more affordable cost. That is the system we need to, to create, and we need to harness the next generation in this effort. That will allow us to speed cures, to have less toxic therapies, and in the next 10 years, I'm going to devote all my time to making this possible. What could be more important? So those of you who are interested, I invite you to join me. There's so many people that I want to thank, Alan and Tovin, for bringing me here and giving me this opportunity, to Jeff for helping me with my personal transformation, to all my coaches, Craig, and others for making me a better person, to Haile DeBoss at UCSF for inviting me to UCSF to try and create my vision there, to the University of California Office of the President, to Karen, to Giorgio, who is my perfect partner. She never says no. <laughs> Ever. She says, well, how do you want to get that done? Well, she doesn't even ask me. She goes, oh, I know how to do that. I love that. The world should be full of people like that. To all my colleagues, Noah, Laura, all the people who have worked with me for so long, to the Quantum Leap Healthcare Collaborative Board, to Salesforce, to, to Clarence So and Mark Benioff, who have really inspired me and been a fantastic partner. To my mother and father, and I thank you for coming tonight, Mom, and for making me believe that anything I wanted to do would be possible. To my siblings, to Lisa and Susan, my best friends ever, my husband who always believes in me. He does say no sometimes, it's so annoying. Um, <laughs> but has been made, made it possible for me to do all that I do and still loves me for it. To my children, Marisa and Max, Max is here tonight who I love more than anything in the world. And the message to you is to choose your balance, to choose your passion, and balance will find its way. Probably. Anyway, I, I would say, or as Max said to me, well, Mom, nothing about you is balanced, but somehow you make it all work. Um, 
And I think lastly, I would say to my patients, a number of whom are in the room tonight, I thank you for inspiring me every day to make things better and to work harder because things are not good enough. So for all that, I thank you. Um, my classmates from the class of 93 had a request of me tonight that I would sing a song. <laughs> so I will sing this, I'll sing a verse of the song that I love most from Wicked. And I do believe that it is true. It is, <clears throat> it is true and it is what happened, it's life happens to you on the way, right? So uh, these are these unintended experiences that if you open yourself to them, will transform your life. I've heard it said that people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn. And we are led to those who help us most to grow if we let them and we help them in return. Well, I don't know if I believe that's true, but I know I'm who I am today because I knew you like a comet pulled from orbit as it crosses the sun like a stream that meets a boulder halfway through a wood who can say if i've been changed for the better but because i knew you i have been changed for good. Thank you very much. Wow, beautiful. Thank you.